education team at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Thank you for everyone coming today and learning about our presentation. I'll be covering stuff about the Challenger Space Shuttle program to the teachers in space. And then we'll be talking a little bit about how President Reagan responded during this national crisis of the Space Shuttle Challenger. But with that, I'm gonna start off with a quote that was stated by President Kennedy at his State of the Union address. And it, and it reads, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And just to give you guys a context about where he was coming from, is that the space program at this point was just beginning to start. This was, President Kennedy was the third president to go into the Cold War. Now I know Cold War, when you hear that, sounds a little bit confusing. So I'm gonna break it down for you. Cold War doesn't necessarily mean a war of people fighting, like what we normally think of war, but it's more of a soft war of words, ideas, and in this case, President Kennedy was introducing technology. So during this time, there was a lot of conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union over all different types of ideas. The Soviet Union was more so towards communism. The United States was democracy. And now President Kennedy was, start, President Kennedy was starting to bring forth technology and this idea of getting a man to the moon. Now, there was... There was all this rise between the two countries and then over who was gonna be the first to get man on the moon. And to that point, I'm going to show a video because on January 20th, 1969, the United States made their, made their stake in the space race. So let's take a look-see about that day and what happened um, in the space race. Space five there. Roger. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. We could see it as it was happening. We could could watch on live television. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. And the fact that 600 million people around the world were either watching or listening on radio and TV as it happened is a measure of the impact that this thing had on the world's consciousness. The surface, as, as we said, uh, was, was fine grain with lots of rocks in it. It took footprints very well and the footprints stayed in place. Uh, the, uh, the limb was in, in good shape and uh, it, it exhibited no damage from uh, the landing or the descent. Picture of the ladder with the uh, well-known plaque. Airman from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. It came in peace with all mankind. After the, the flight of Apollo 11, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and I had an around the world tour. And uh, every place we went, I, I thought they'd in some places have the attitude of, oh, well, you Americans finally did this. Not at all. They, uh, the attitude, every country, uh, regardless of their internal politics, uh, they all said, we did it. We humans. Everything before July 20th, 1969, Humans only had experience on one planetary body. From that moment on, we were, at least in some measure, a multi-planetary species. When Neil and Buzz uh, walked on the moon, uh, they did it, of course, without weapons. The only thing they brought was cameras. So it was a very, it was a, a peaceful uh, enterprise and one that was applauded uh, worldwide. So a momentous occasion for, for our country. And really like from looking at that video, one thing that I'd like to highlight is this wasn't just an accomplishment for one country, but an accomplishment for mankind as a whole. The whole world was watching this moment. So after that moment in 1969, our space program continued to evolve. I have for you two pictures. On the left is the Apollo mission that we saw with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin of how the rocket looked. And then we fast forward to how space continued to evolve. If you look on the left, you see 
a more slender rocket. Um, it was really designed to have high speed so that way it could launch the astronauts into space very quickly so they could get picked up by the moon's gravitational pull. And that only carried three astronauts. And then we fast forward to the space shuttle program, which to give you guys an idea, much bigger rockets because the space shuttles were meant really to be within the Earth's atmosphere. Now, the moon rockets only carried three people, whereas the space shuttle carried up to seven. And really what it was designed to outside of staying within the Earth, Earth's orbit was to manage the satellites, conduct experiments, and then later on we kind of see the, the rise of the space station where it was used for docking purposes as well. Now the space shuttle program continued to evolve and then in 1984 NASA decided to take a new step in our space program. And that was when they initiated the Teachers in Space initiative with President Ronald Reagan. And we have a video that captures that that I hope you will enjoy. Communicating this space experience, sending someone into Earth orbit who could tell us what it's like in our own terms has long been a NASA goal. And in August 1984, the Space Flight Participant Program was given the green light by President Reagan. Today I'm directing NASA to begin a search in all of our elementary and secondary schools and to choose as the first citizen passenger in the history of our space program, one of America's finest, a teacher. Last June, the semifinalists in NASA's Teacher in Space project met the press for the first time in Washington, D.C. The 114 educators selected from over 11,000 applicants spent a week in the nation's capital, becoming familiar with the history of space travel, and of course, taking notes in workshops dealing with various aspects of shuttle flight. Let's get it red hot. The next major milestone came in early July when the 10 finalists were announced. These teachers had survived an extensive screening process, but they had to demonstrate even more right stuff during their two week stay at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. After a series of tests to ensure that they were medically fit to fly aboard the shuttle, the 10 were given a ride on the KC-135, a hollowed out padded jet that simulates weightlessness for short periods of time. Finally, on July 19th, Vice President drive. Bush made the historic announcement. Barbara Morgan, an elementary school teacher from McCall, Idaho, was selected as the backup candidate, and Krista McCullough, a Concord, New Hampshire high school social studies teacher, will be the one to actually fly in space early next year. It's, it's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. When that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> But there's going to be 10 souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. That's great. So Krista McCullough, I, I always get a little bit shaky when I, when I think about that, because I always think back when I was in high school and thinking about my history teacher and thinking, could I see my history teacher going to space? And then all of a sudden it's becoming true within a matter of, of minutes. It's kind of crazy. Uh, I don't know how all of you feel about it with, if you think about your history teacher being selected to be going to space, but it's a crazy concept. Uh, just to give you some background on her, as, as you might have uh, heard, she was a social, teach social studies teacher at Concord High School in New Hampshire. She was chosen out of 10,000 applicants. Now, if you think about that number really quick, and I know some of you are going through the college application process, imagine applying to college and out of all the applicants, you're the only one that's selected to go to college. It's kind of a crazy number, 10,000 applicants being selected into this program. And really what she was, what she wanted to accomplish by going to space was to inspire her students to venture into the fields of math and science and like reach for their goals. Don't say that nothing is impossible, which really rings true now for for me in terms of, and, and I hope all of you as well, is like reaching for your goals and what you can accomplish. And I know we're going through this time of distance learning and all of us are at home, especially you students are at home 
going through the Zoom process. But just to give you an idea, this was what uh, Krista McCullough was going to do when she was in space. What you see before you right now is a curriculum that was going to be passed out to teachers. And Krista was going to videotape herself from the space shuttle teaching these lessons. And then it would be trans, she would then transmit it back down to Earth, which would then be distributed to teachers. So students could learn a lot, learn along with Krista as she went through her experiences in space, very similar to what we're doing right now with this whole Zoom concept. So I have a question for you guys. In one word, now that I've taught you a little bit about Krista, what's one thing that comes to mind? For me, it's she is so inspiring. The fact that a teacher who has a family, has all the yeah, courage, perfect, dedicated to her students, absolutely. Brave, yeah. Um, I don't know how I would do about traveling up into the Earth's atmosphere, going hundreds of miles, calm. Trailblazer, I like that, trailblazer, definitely. So with that, we'll go on. I think you guys definitely put some really good answers out there. So with this, um, I'd like to then transfer to the day of the launch and give you guys a firsthand experience about what the launch was like. Star B hydraulic power units have started. T minus 21 seconds and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engine's beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. Engines at 65%. The engines uh, are running normally. Very good fuel cells. Very good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. So the 25th Space Shuttle mission uh, is now down. on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning, it looks as though they were not going to be able to get off. Velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Here, looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously, a major malfunction. So, on that fateful day, Jan January 28th, 1986, we lost the Space Shuttle Challenger. That mission only lasted all of 73 seconds, and all seven of the astronauts, including our friend Krista, passed away within the moment of the explosion. So really let's unpack what happened. So the, they have been postponing the launch numerous days, trying to find the best weather uh, overnight because they have to have the rocket outside. Some of the fuel valves had frozen. And during the morning check, uh, they hadn't noticed that, some of the engineers didn't notice that some of them had frozen over. And they thought that they had defrosted them all and the flames from the engine had 
caused them to break, which then caused the explosion that you saw before you. Now, this was the first time ever in the United States history that we had lost astronauts in flight. There was an accident that had happened in the earlier Mercury missions that had caused the, the rocket to explode on the ground, but this was the first time in flight. So you've seen this tragic event, and what I'd like you guys to do, if you can, exp try and come up with one word to describe how this video made you feel. Yeah, I would say shock is huge for me too. I mean, you see this rocket, it's flying up, everything looks great, people are plotting, and then it explodes right in front of you. Sad, definitely. So you think about this, take your hat off and put on now, if you could think in the, the light of the president, President Reagan, which during this time in January, he's preparing for a State of the Union address. On this very day, he's actually preparing to, to go before Congress and give his State of the Union address. And this is the word, this is the words that come into him that the space shuttle, shuttle Challenger had just exploded. Now, this is a picture of him seeing it because he didn't, he didn't have a chance. He was watching it live. And think about what's going through. Think about if you were president of the United States. Now you're faced to put on this new hat. You have to think about how you're going to address a nation. You have a bunch of people who are very scared, a bunch of people very sad. You have all these families that have now lost their loved ones, husbands, wives, fathers, and mothers. And you now are placed to sit in a chair and how to go about caring for a nation that is grieving. And what I put to you is three things that I want you to, that we're gonna walk through exactly how a president can deal with tra tragedy. Uh, and we're gonna go through some of them right now. First is being prepared. Now, when a president is getting ready to give a, a major speech, he has to make sure he knows who's in the room. Who, are the, who, are, who is he speaking to? Know your audience. It's a very big concept because you have to know how you're going to word your speech and how you're going to address the people that are in the room and watching you speak. And the next is also be prepared. Now, I can say, I, I want to express to all of you as students, I'm sure before you go before a presentation or if you're going to give a project, especially maybe handing in a final paper, tend to get kind of freaked out because you're afraid you may forget it at home. You're afraid that it didn't go through email. So you always want to, you know, you may think you want to have like a backup copy just to make sure that you're safe. Well, the president has one too, because he's moving around throughout the whole day. He may have not had the, the copy with him. So he's always carrying a backup of the speech that he's going to give just so that way, in case the teleprompters go off, he forgets it somewhere. It, he has a backup ready to go. So with that, I'd like to ask a question for you. Have you ever showed up to class unprepared and how did that make you feel? I know one time I had to give a presentation in grad school and it didn't load up into class and I freaked out a little bit. And luckily my professor granted me an extension. Yeah, I'm mad too. I get frustrated like if the internet connection isn't working. That's scared that my teacher is going to get mad. Absolutely. So the next thing is be encouraging. So presidents will always put in famous quotes, something that can lift the spirits of the, the audience that he's speaking to. You see it all the time with our public leaders. They always have particular quotes that speak to them because during this time when we're feeling anxious, we're feeling sad, we're feeling all these different types of, of issues in our head, we need something to uplift us. So President Reagan found a lot of famous quotes to inspire the American people during this time. And presidents have used it in the past as well to make people feel more settled, even though the emotions are still rising, there's, there's some type of peace to what's being presented to them. And next, and also being encouraging, it's writing letters especially to the families that have just lost their loved ones. Presidents will use letters to let them know that, hey, I'm here. I feel with you. I grieve with you. And in so it almost creates an, an atmosphere where, you know, the president is 
the head of the country, but he can also be a member of your family just by the small tokens of a letter. So President Reagan was also big on writing letters, especially to the members of those families that lost their loved ones on that fateful day. So in taking all this together, then you're asked as President of the United States to, have to communicate this to the nation. So when you communicate, yeah, there's certain elements you want to, to bring into your speech. I mentioned bringing great resources. You want a call to action. What is it that you're going to present? What is it that you're asking of the American people? What is it that you're going to put forth? The timing of the speech. I mean, President Reagan made sure that he approached the nation right away. And then also on top of that, he put, he put, they put together a, a national funeral for all the astronauts too, which we're going to watch in a little bit to present a way so that the whole nation could grieve together and, and more so honor those astronauts for taking, putting their, their lives at stake to expand the nation in the space program. And I have for you a small clip of President Reagan at that national funeral. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans, to share the grief that we all feel, and perhaps in that sharing to find the strength to bear our sorrow and the courage to look for the seeds of hope. Our nation's loss is first a profound personal loss to the family and the friends and the loved ones of our shuttle astronauts. To those they left behind, the mothers, the fathers, the husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, yes, and especially the children. All of America stands beside you in your time of sorrow. What we say today is only an inadequate expression of what we carry in our hearts. Words pale in the shadow of grief they seem insufficient even to measure the brave sacrifice of those you loved and we so admired. Their truest testimony will not be in the words we speak, but in the way they led their lives and in the way they lost their lives. With dedication, honor, and an unquenchable desire to explore this mysterious and beautiful universe. The best we can do is remember our seven astronauts, our Challenger 7. Remember them as they lived, bringing life and love and joy to those who knew them and pride to a nation. They came from all parts of this great country, from South Carolina to Washington State, Ohio to Mohawk, New York, Hawaii to North Carolina, to Concord, New Hampshire. They were so different, yet in their mission, their quest, they held so much in common. We remember Dick Scobie, the commander who spoke the last words we heard from the Space Shuttle Challenger. He served as a fighter pilot in Vietnam, earning many medals for bravery, later as a test pilot of advanced aircraft before joining the space program. Danger was a familiar companion to Commander Scobie. We remember Michael Smith, who earned enough medals as a combat pilot to cover his chest, including the Navy Distinguished Flying Cross, three air medals, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with Silver Star, in gratitude from a nation he fought to keep free. We remember Judith Resnick, known as JR to her friends, always smiling, always eager to make a contribution, finding beauty in the music she played on her piano in her off hours. We remember Ellison Onizuka, who was a child running barefoot through the coffee fields and macadamia groves of Hawaii, dreamed of someday traveling to the moon. Being an Eagle Scout, he said, had helped him soar to the impressive achievements of his career. We remember Ronald McNair, who said that he learned perseverance in the cotton fields of South Carolina. His dream was to live aboard the space station, 
performing experiments and playing his saxophone in the weightlessness of space. Oh, Ron, we will miss your saxophone and we will build your space station. We remember Gregory Jarvis. On that ill-fated flight, he was carrying with him a flag of his university in Buffalo, New York. A small token, he said, to the people who unlocked his future. We remember Krista McAuliffe, who captured the imagination of the entire nation. Inspires with her pluck, her restless spirit of discovery, a teacher not just to her students, but to an entire people. Instilling us all with the excitement of this journey we ride into the future. We will always remember them, these skilled professionals, scientists and adventurers, these artists and teachers and family men and women, and we will cherish each of their stories. Stories of triumph and bravery, stories of true American heroes. On the day of the disaster. So those are some wise words we heard from the president. And I presented to you before this slide some concepts about how a president can address and communicate in a time of grieving and just presenting in a speech. And I want to see were there any elements that you saw in how President Reagan handled this very momentous occasion of addressing the nation and saying goodbye to these astronauts? What are your thoughts, guys? Yeah, personalized each person, that definitely stuck to me too. Calming. Emotional. I like there's a part in that first part where he addresses how he thanks them for putting their lives at risk to advance the United States space program. And knowing that they put their lives at risk, they took the, the greatest sacrifice for their country. Thankful, yes, absolutely. So I want to transfer from kind of a solemn note to where's our space program going today? Now, it's very momentous because it actually was announced only moments before we started this presentation. But today, we are starting what many have dubbed as the space race part two. And NASA has partnered up with both SpaceX and Blue Lunar, uh, both uh, very popular people who are in charge of those companies. You have SpaceX, which is uh, Elon Musk, and then you have Blue Lunar, which is Jeff Bezos' baby, and they are together going to put together a program. They have awarded money, they have both been awarded money from NASA. Um, Jeff Bezos and his Blue Lunar project has, have been awarded $579 million to create a new lunar a lunar mod module. And SpaceX with Elon Musk has been awarded $135 million for the space shuttle. And they are going to start by going back to the moon sometime here in the next year that that, that mission will take place. But it's very exciting because the last time that any space shuttle went into flight with two, was 2011. So this is the first time in our nation's history that we're starting to go back to space, but also back to the moon. Believe it or not, no one has gone back to the moon since 1979. So this is a very momentous occasion for our country. And I'd like to end things today before I open it up for questions with a quote. I started with a quote. I'd like to end with a quote. And this one is by Elon Musk. And it's very momentous into where we can see our space program going. And it reads, in order for us to have a future that's exciting and inspiring, it has to be one where space bearing civilization. So maybe one day we'll be able to afford houses on the moon. Maybe one day we'll all get a chance to go to Mars on a, on a vacation. But that concludes my lecture, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will stay on for questions, whatever pops into your mind. I know we went through this presentation. You guys probably have 
any questions about the Challenger, the Teacher in Space program, President Reagan, anything that I can answer for you guys, I'm here. So one, I see one question is like, is this going to get emailed to us? Well, I know this lecture is going to be uploaded onto our portal, but I also have for you guys my email as well as a blog to our Reagan blog. I in, encourage you guys to look. We have a bunch of curriculums that we're putting, that we've put out. We also have a lot of information on the Challenger as well. If you'd like to go to our Reagan education through the National Archives that you can get more information. Let me read through some of these questions. Did the explosion cause any interruption in the space program at that time? Uh, he really, uh, the, there was a break. I mean, it wasn't like we started the space, but there were a few more Challenger missions that existed. And as I mentioned in 2011, we did have uh, the space, we did send shuttles to space. So it didn't put it completely on hold, no. Why did they have the pro why did they have a project like Challenger? So really, as I mentioned earlier, space shuttles were meant to develop experiments while they're on the Earth's atmosphere. So space shuttles would go up and they would conduct a lot of experiments built on the space, like the ozone, and really start to understand how space worked um, as well as how the Earth's atmosphere worked. As I showed earlier to today, space shuttles would also fly up to do work on satellites to repair them so that way that we can continue to do studies through space. Would astronauts still be riding in shuttles if the explosion didn't occur? Actually, astronauts still ride in space shuttles to this day. So they've continued despite this, that small hiccup that we had with that Challenger. Okay, do we have any last questions for our presenter? All right, it looks like we're all set. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you Greg for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, like Greg mentioned, his email is up there and the recordings are always available on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can always find them there. And we do have some sessions coming up, so hopefully we'll see you again. But thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks again, Greg. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Stay safe. Bye.